Okay. All right. Hello, nonprofit leaders. Thank you for joining us today. I am Nancy Manning, and I will be your moderator today. I am the founder of Austin Nonprofit Meetup and Power Your Mission. I'd like to give a huge shout out of thanks to Shannon Mantrum, who is the executive director of Loop to Success and the operations manager for Launchpad Job Club, and she will be our Zoom host today. I'd like to take care of just a couple of housekeeping issues very quickly before we introduce our panelists. So we're asking everybody to keep the chat box completely closed until we open the Zoom floor for questions. And when we do, hopefully you'll be taking notes as we go. And this format is what you're going to use. You may have noticed that all the panelists' names starts with M. So it will be easier for you to use this format when you're asking questions in the chat box. And this format will be given to you again when we do open the floor for your questions. So with us today, we have Michael McCoy, Senior Program Officer for the Meadows Foundation, Michelle Renkin, Impact Incubator for Impact Austin, Michelle walker Moak. Of, uh, the Global Community Affairs Manager at Applied Materials, and Megan Stillman, co-dean of Austin Chapter of the Austin Foundation. And we are going to begin with Megan. So let me, I'm going to get out of the PowerPoint, and Megan, you're good to go. Uh, hi, I'm Megan, and um... I am the co-dean of the Austin chapter of the Awesome Foundation. The Awesome Foundation itself uh, was started in like 2009 by a tech entrepreneur in Boston who wanted to get more involved in his community and giving. And since then, there are now 91 chapters of the Austin of the Awesome Foundation in four countries. Most of them are centered around a location, for example, Austin. Um, but then there are also some thematic chapters, including Awesome Libraries, Awesome Vegan, Awesome Disabilities, and Awesome Without Borders. The uh, Awesome Foundation itself basically exists um, to host our web platform and to host our annual-ish summit where everybody from all the different chapters can come together and discuss different ideas. The whole point of the Awesome Foundation is furthering the interest of awesome a thousand dollars at a time. Uh, every month or so, our 10-ish trustees get together, we put in a hundred dollars, and we donate a thousand dollars to whomever we want for whatever reason we want. Um, it's, there are no strings attached grants, and uh, our uh, sorry, my notes are all sort of screwed up. So <laughs> the idea is that uh, they are all very no strings attached and very loose and uh, individual, uh, an individual way of giving. Um, our funding priorities are sort of just whatever we, whatever the trustees feel at that time. Um, we have two kinds of, two categories of, pro we sort all of our projects into different categories. We call them orphan projects or flamethrower projects. And the orphan projects are basically like somebody's baby. Um, they tend to be, you know, health related or education related, things like that. And then we have our flamethrower projects, which are usually a wild and crazy art projects. Um, and whether, whether or not we give to an orphan project versus a flamethrower is just how we're feeling that month. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, so the Austin chapter of the Austin Foundation started in, I think, about 2009, but didn't really get started in earnest until 2012. And since then, we've given out $85,000 to 85 different projects in Austin. Um, so let's see. We, particularly in our chapter, we just get together every month and we go over our applications. We talk them out. We hash through them, why we like one project versus the other, and until we generally come to a consensus. 
we never have had to institute the, uh, you know, majority rules rule. Um, we, always, we always seem to come to a consensus. Other chapters in other parts of the country will often host pitch parties where they get uh, their top four grants together at a bar and have them pitch to everybody at the bar. I think one of the best parts of the Awesome Foundation is that every chapter is different in how they operate. Um, let's see, so our so main- you know, is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but in other words, you have chapters in other states, right? Yes, there are more chapters. There are other chapters in Texas. There's a San Antonio chapter and a Plano chapter. Um, almost every other state has a chapter uh, somewhere. Um, not all of them, but almost every other one. Uh, and then, like I said, there are thematic chapters, which are not limited to any location or place, but rather a particular theme. Uh, let's see. So our application process is designed to be very simple, and very easy, and very streamlined. We uh, don't take phone calls. We do everything online. You can always email us or you can um, reach out to us on social media if you have any questions and we're always happy to answer them. And then the application process is also online and it's maybe five questions aside from like name and location. And we do not ask for any complicated financial, we don't ask for any financials at all. Um, because that doesn't really matter to us. We don't have restrictions on donating to 501c3s only or anything like that. Um, we have, so our main, our main overarching goal is the no strings attached idea. You can propose a project and we may award you the thousand dollars. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Um, we have only had issues of the, we've only had issues with people not fulfilling their projects twice uh, in, since 2012, and one of the people gave the money back. So that was pretty fancy. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what stands out in an application to us is just really how awesome your project is. And I know that's a really vague term, but we like it that way. We like it to be vague. We want everybody to have a, we mostly just love hearing what's going on and what everybody is working on. And um, so that's about it as far as what stands out in an application. Sometimes it's just, if we donated to an orphan project last month, we'll don't only donate to flamethrowers this month. Sometimes not. Just sort of depends on how we're feeling. Um, I do have adv some advice for grant seekers is that we'll usually post on our social media like our top four or five projects, uh, our runners up basically. And if you're one of those runners up, we encourage you to apply again because it generally means that it was a great project, but there was just a greater project. So if you try again, you have a chance at winning again. If you go three or four months without making it to that top spot, that's usually your sign that it's just not awesome enough. <laughs> um, so how do we change things for the coronavirus? Well, we met remotely as opposed to in person. That was the first thing. And this month we really focused on having our thousand dollars making the greatest impact. Um, and so we decided to donate our thousand dollars this month to the Central Texas Food Bank because they are serving all Austin, all of Austinites and hunger and food is such a basic necessity and need. And on top of that, they had a few uh, grant uh, donation matching programs. So our thousand dollars ended up being more like, I think 2,500 and that, helped us feel like we were doing the most good. We actually didn't receive many applications this month. Um, most of them were from before the lockdown happened and they just didn't really seem to be, uh, it just seemed like they were a relic from a different time and that it wouldn't necessarily serve Austin the best. And then we had a few applications for people asking for us to save their business, which was, we wish we could save everybody's business, but we can't. 
Um, I think, I think maybe that might be all that I have to say. Okay, uh, Megan. Yes. Oh, two things. One is somebody is one person is having trouble hearing you and asked you to get a little closer to your mic. Okay. But our wonderful Zoom host has summarized what you said in the chat box, which thank you, Shannon. <laughs> but uh, anyway, one other question I have for you is: um, Has Awesome Foundation been affected in its funding or its process by the COVID nineteen? Uh, no, not so much. We are not yet anyway. Um, so far, so it's based up on, uh, based on the trustees, uh, which I am one, and we all put in $100 a month. And unfortunately, since I think in the last few years, unfortunately, the, fin the economic situation has caused us to lose out on a few trustees. So we're only able to give out a grant every other month instead of every month, which is ideal. Um, but it doesn't seem that the, it doesn't seem that the coronavirus would uh, affect the current trustees that we have. Okay. Hope to gain more, but you know, it just depends on who can give $100 every month. Okay, I'm just typing something to one. I guess it's, um, is anybody else having trouble hearing me right now? Because Robin just said she can't hear me. No, everybody should be hearing fine. Um, if they, if you have issues, um, type, type me in the chat bar. We'll see what we can do. Um, I think Robin, I'll just have to get with her. She's probably muted on her end. Okay. Okay, thank you, Patrick. All right, um, we can go ahead then. Let me introduce to you, uh, Michelle. Uh, okay, which Michelle? Michelle Walker Moak, the Global Community Affairs Manager for Applied Materials. Hi there. <laughs> um, hi, so I'm Michelle Walker Moak. There's a lot of Michelles, but um, I'm Michelle with 1L. I've been at Applied Materials and the Applied Materials Foundation for, I think, a little, like 22 years now. How many? Uh, How many? 22. Oh my. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I've been there a while. And for those of you who don't know who Applied Materials is, we're a technology-based company. Um, we have our headquarters in Silicon Valley, California, but we have a large manufacturing site in Austin. We have about um, 3,500 both regular full-time employees and temporary employees working in Austin, Texas, just right off 290 East as you're kind of heading out towards uh, Manor, the Manor area. And um, at that location, we manufacture machines that make semiconductors. Um, and as part of our corporate citizenship, we have an Applied Materials Foundation. And the foundation was started back in the early 1990s so that as a company, we knew we wanted to be good corporate citizens. And by creating a foundation, it allowed us to give back on a very consistent basis. And we weren't as dependent on business cycles. So it allowed us consistent giving back in locations um, where we have a business presence. So although we our second largest site is in Austin, we do have sites all over the world. Um, so in relation to COVID-19, we've actually been dealing with it for a while. We have a location in Wuhan, China. Um, so we actually started managing some response to that kind of very early on, both in China, we have a location in Northern Italy. Um, so again, we've, we're kind of working with both our Chinese office, our Italian office, we have a location in New York, we have a location again in the Bay Area. So um, what's happened recently in the past few months has been quite different for us, although we've dealt and managed with disasters in the past, it's usually been in one location, like through a hurricane or a flood, where we're able to kind of really focus um, in all of our resources into one location. And so for us, in managing crisis response and disaster response and giving back from a philanthropic standpoint, we've really had to respond quickly and in multiple locations. Um, so it's been kind of a crash course in how do you gear up and have a response. Um, we've had a lot of really deep discussions around equity um, and managing um, giving back and 
those in supporting our employees and supporting communities that we care about. Um, so um, I'll jump back to kind of in general what our funding priorities are and hopefully I can also respond a little bit about impact of COVID-19 in terms of our giving in just a minute. But in general, our funding priorities are primarily in, in pre-K through 12 um, education, again, in locations where we have a location. So in Austin, we do a lot of work with the Austin ISD as well as Manor ISD. We work with nonprofits to bring them into the schools to help support um, student achievement um, in, in a lot of those locations and in general in Central Texas. Primarily a lot of education funding. I would say about 50% of our portfolio really is around education. We also support arts and culture, which is a little unusual, I think, for a lot of technology companies to support arts and culture, but we believe in a strong and vibrant community. Uh, we also believe in creative um, culture and innovation, and we think those go hand in hand. So we do a lot of work in supporting um, the arts, also um, broad appeal for the public in terms of making a vibrant creative community and arts education work. Um, we also support what we call civic engagement, which is basic needs funding, um, and that is food, shelter, housing. Um, uh, Megan mentioned the Central Texas Food Bank. They're a big uh, partner of ours. We do a lot of work with them, um, but it, you know we're looking at providing those basic needs for um, Austinites through, through that fund. And then we also do environmental education work. Um, and we started that and Nancy and I have a history there and we've done some work and that's really about how do we teach children to be good stewards of the earth. A lot of it is getting them out into nature, kind of rolling their sleeves up and kind of getting their hands dirty to help them connect better with nature. But we think it, um, through those connections, we're really building an education and a basis for them to respect and understand stewardship as they move on for the future. Um, and then our latest area, and, and this is a, a new area for us, we really started um, doing some work two years ago around girls empowerment. And we created a whole funding portfolio called Generation Girl um, and launched that two years ago. That was meant to be kind of almost a separate area of funding for us for Generation Girl. It was a three-year fund that we're working at with a select group of organizations. Um, and we're working on looking at how do we empower the next generation of girls. Um, so those are kind of our funding areas. We have an open grant application process. It's online. And if you go to appliedmaterials.com, you can search under society and all of our grant information is there. Um, we review grant applications for the general four areas twice a year. And that's January 15th is one application deadline. And then the next one is June 15th. So um, you would apply during one of those times. We usually review and get back to you by March 30th um, and um, August 30th. Although I will tell you with the COVID-19, we're a little off in terms of getting back on our first um, grant cycle for the January grants that are coming in because we're having to make some adjustments. Um, but in general, open grant application, you do have to be a 501c3. It was so interesting to hear Megan's um, and how she runs their giving because it's, it's really interesting to see all of the breadth of what's out there for folks. We're a little bit more traditional as a foundation. We do have the requirement of um, it being a full 501c3 nonprofit. Um, you do have to submit financials um, and we do a, a pretty rigorous review process in terms of, um, and, and the grant amounts really vary and they project. Most of our grants are programmatic grant funds. Um, and I would say in general, it's gonna vary anywhere from about $5,000. I think our largest one is like $50,000. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really looking at how it best meets those guidelines that I talked about in our four areas and where we can really make an impact. Um, let's see, we talked about um, phone calls are tough. So I manage our grants for all of our North America locations outside of California. 
Um, and so I have a grant portfolio of probably around 100 different nonprofits that I partner with and work with on a regular basis, not to mention the inquiries that are. So I will say for really hard for me, if, if you want a response, the best way is really via email. Um, and I'm happy to respond to give you as much feedback as I can in terms of, is this something that we would consider funding? Um, it's a competitive grant process. We have a set budget. Um, we're looking at, you know, the execution, the program itself, and, um, and how that best fits into those guidelines. And I wish we could fund them all, but unfortunately, um, we can't. So, so it, it's really tough. You know, one of the things a lot of people ask me about my job and talk about what a great, what a great opportunity is to help so many folks, and it really is. But one of the toughest things is really deciding and making the decisions on how best to invest the funding because there are so many great opportunities. So it's really difficult. It's really hard and you're making some tough choices on, on making those decisions. Um, advice for grant seekers um, is be very clear and concise in the grant application. We do want anecdotal stories, but really if you can be super upfront with what we're funding, how the program works, and what the impact is gonna be, and what the budget is needed to cover it. Um, what's difficult for us is if we're reading, I'm, I'm reading hundreds of grant applications, and if I'm reading through and I've read, you know, I'm on page two, and it's hard for me to really decipher what you're asking from, for it's precisely, how is, how much money you're asking for and what precisely it's going to do. Um, that's a little frustrating. So I am just like more of a journalistic approach to grant applications, meaning, you know, start with your lead, right? Start with the lead in terms of what is it that you're needing um, funds for and, and how will the impact be? And then you can add in some of the detail as you go down. And we'll also follow up if there are further questions that we have from you. Um, we'll also follow up via email a lot of times if there are some more details. Um, in terms of COVID-19 and how we have been impacted, I think I talked about that we, we've been impacted a lot because all of our locations are, are managing and dealing with this. Um, so in Austin, what we were able to do is do some rapid response grants for COVID-19 relief, very specific for COVID-19 relief by supporting the Central Texas Food Bank and also the Altogether ATX Fund. So we were able to immediately get some funds out that we knew were gonna be able to help um, support those basic needs. But in addition, with the Altogether ATX Fund, we're really looking at supporting nonprofits in general. And their third level of funding for the Altogether ATX Fund is really gonna be targeting about general support for the nonprofit community. So it's really about sustaining nonprofits. So by us making that donation, it was our help of supporting all the nonprofits community in Austin to be able to sustain through this challenging time. Um, in addition to the immediate response grants that we made, we also were, um, extended our impact report dates. So if, if you do receive a grant from us, we do require an impact report within a year. Um, letting us know what the results were of the investment and the grant. Did it happen? What did you learn? Those are the kinds of questions that are on our impact report. We immediately extended those um, grants out another two months. So people who were, we knew they were dealing with some other issues rather than um, getting a report to us on time. So we wanted to be as flexible as possible um, for folks. We also um, kind of did a, an immediate grant review and looked at where it made sense to transition from programmatic grant funding into general operating funds. And we had one-on-one -on -one conversations with a couple of grantees about transitioning just to general operating funds rather than the program piece. Um, I think we understand that we need to be flexible um, during this time that um, some of the the best laid plans, right? And, and right now everybody's trying to figure out how to make that transition. And we just wanna be supportive of our nonprofit partners and understanding, um, just communicating with us what those changes are gonna be. And then we can maybe need to make adjustments on our, our side. Um, 
for our June 15th grant application, um, the changes that we're planning on making there is we're re-looking re at our applications and we're gonna move everybody to the short form application. Again, just to make it easier for people to apply. Um, we're also reviewing our impact reports for that to make that shorter and more concise. So I think our goal is to make um, app applying for funds from us as easy as possible, but also within the guidelines that we need to have being a foundation, a corporate foundation. So we're trying to make those adjustments and we're trying to be as flexible as we can um, with nonprofits. Um, I think what stands out both positive and negative um, for us is that people who've done the homework, who've looked at um, what our grant guidelines are, what the right fit is for us. Um, again, concisely written um, to the point grant applications are great with supporting documentation um, is, is really helpful on how to best tell your story. And um, sometimes it's a great and it's the right fit for us. And then we look at how do we leverage other things besides just investment dollars. So we're also looking at how do we leverage our employees from a volunteer perspective a lot of times as well. So there's other ways that we can engage beyond just the investment of the grant. Um, and that's the advantage, I think, of being a, a company um, and having some other aspects that we hope to um, help support with, which is our employee base. So in other words, you provide employees for certain projects and volunteers? Where it makes sense, um, we can't guarantee volunteers for everything, but where it makes sense, we definitely do um, market volunteer opportunities to our employees. And we also provide our employees with a matching gifts program. So if employees um, want to support organizations, they have $3,000 in matching dollars per year. Um, so, so they can pretty much donate to a charity of their choice and request matching funds on an annual basis. And in fact, for COVID relief response, we just increased that match up to $5,000 per employee until October. So we're, again, trying to empower our employees to better give back during this, these challenging times. All right, well, thank you so much, Michelle. It's great to see you. All right, so next, let me go over here. I'm going to introduce another Michelle, Michelle Rankin, Impact incubator for impact option you're on thank you thank you and thank you for your time everyone this afternoon i appreciate y'all taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in this meetup so for those that aren't familiar with impact austin it is an austin-based uh, women's collective giving circle that funds central texas nonprofits that are providing services in Travis, Williamson, Hayes, or Bastrop counties. It was started um, 16 years ago by Rebecca Powers after the uh, death of her brother. And um, to date, we've given over $7 million to um, 83 different grants um, to organizations in Central Texas. And we're largely a member-driven organization. Um, so women join annually. Um, you give a donation of uh, right now it's a thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, and 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 a thousand of that goes to local uh, Central Texas nonprofits every year through our grants program, and the other two hundred and fifty goes to education and operations of the organization itself and education for its members. And so our grant review process is largely member driven. You can participate as heavily in the process as you would like to narrow down um, the grant applicants to uh, two finalists, um, if you're on one of the committees. And then all the membership gets to um, hear pitches and view uh, packets from the finalists to select the recipients each year um, and typically uh, most years it is a uh, winner take all so all the applicants um, we have five different grants that we give out and in each of those categories the one uh, winner that is selected by the membership um, gets all the funding for that particular category um, when when i get to this year and COVID 19 changes i'll talk about a few changes we made for this year 
But as far as our um, funding priorities, we have program grants and we have three of those and they fund a different pro two year uh, program or project uh, run by a, uh, by a specific uh, nonprofit. Oh, my cat just came in. Can you, can you hear him meowing? Sorry about that. <laughs> So we have three different categories of uh, program grants. We have a community grant, which can be for economic, social, environmental, or cultural enrichment. We have an education grant that is uh, furthering the ability to educate or improve education. And then we have a health and well-being uh, grant for uh, families and children and positively impacting a mental or physical wellness of people. Then we have a catalyst grant, um, which um, provides a funding to a, a nonprofit to strengthen or grow or enhance um, their programs. Um, so this is largely for operational um, use to improve the performance and impact and stability of your organizations. So this is a this grant was added in 2015 because we realized that some grants need um, funding and some uh, nonprofits need funding just to take their organization to the next level, um, not specifically to run some new program or project, but then to build the overall capacity of their organization. And then our, our final grant is the social innovation grant, which was a new grant that we piloted last year. And that was the program I was brought on board to to, to run. And this one's different in that we pick a topic that um, we believe is particularly relevant to our, um, to our um, Central Texas community and, and we look for grants that are on that specific topic. And so last year's and this year's was for advancing equity for women and girls of color. And the one additional uh, requirement for this grant is that it must be a collaborative. Um, so we're looking to um, increase outcomes by working collaboratively. And so while none, one nonprofit will submit uh, the grant, we were expecting it to be a collaboration of multiple organizations. Um, in addition to our women's uh, arm of Impact Austin, there is a G3 Girls Giving Grants um, uh, arm as well, which is modeled after the women's arm, but it's, it's high school girls doing a similar um, process. And so um, they donate $100 as opposed to, um, to $1,000 uh, or $1,250. And um, they get to go through the same process to select their grant recipients uh, for their programs. Um, all of our grants uh, applications are done online. If you have um, questions, um, we have an email address that you can send it in because we're very, um, we want to ensure that anything we do is equitable against for all of our applicants. And so we have, you know, what are two volunteers that are trained in how to respond to all different um, types of questions. And so when you, when you send emails to this central um, email address, they will respond um, to the questions to make sure that uh, they're getting consistent answers to all of our applicants. Um, the timelines right now, um, so the program catalyst and G3 grants, typically they open up in November. Um, the applications, the, they're due in early December. And then we go through our grant review process and they're awarded, we have our annual meeting in early June and where the finalists present to the, uh, to the membership. We are adjusting that due to COVID-19 um, this year. But, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. For our social innovation grant, we wanted to give an opportunity for a, um, people to apply at another time of year um, and for our membership to also participate in these grant reviews um, at another time of year. So that program kicks off in July. Uh, the applicants applications kick off in July. They go through August. Um, the grant is awarded in November. Um, and it's a very thorough process where we have the grant review committees with the members. There are multiple phases. We do site visits and then, and then it culminates in the final presentations to the membership. 
Um, so we do have a very thorough uh, process for all of our grants. Um, as far as how COVID-19 is impacting us, so we immediately got together uh, with COVID-19 and started thinking, because we were in the middle of our major grant cycle, review cycle, and how do, how do we want to uh, adjust for that? And we had three top priorities, and one was concern for our applicants and the well-being of our applicants and our membership. The second was the importance to get out funding quickly and broadly to, the, uh, to our nonprofit communities that were struggling. And then the third was preservation of our membership engagement model because that is one of our core tenants to Impact Austin is that as a member, you get to vote on how the funds are, are spent. And so um, we shortened and uh, abbreviated some of the stages that we would typically do, like we would typically do site visits um, with our three semifinalists in each category. We skipped that phase. We went straight to uh, the, the grant review committees voting on finalists in a, April. And then um, we normally have an in-person meeting in June where the finalists present. We said we were gonna do video presentations um, short five minute video presentations of our finalists, which are going out this week, along with a packet. And our membership is going to vote offline um, via um, online forms. And so then we can get our funding out to our recipients in um, early May as opposed to early June. Um, so we shortened it by a month. And um, in addition, we changed our funding that normally we would give 100K, $100,000 for each of these grants, winner take all. We said, okay, our, both of our finalists, we want to walk away with something. And so we're giving 75K to the uh, first place recipient and 25K to the second place recipient. And, um, and even though we know that some of these applications that people submitted they may have changed. They may have been wanting to do a program that they can't do anymore. So we understand and acknowledge that, that your program that you submitted to us may not be what your top priority is anymore. You can adjust to use the funding to whatever you see fit. And so that was a, another major change for us for uh, this year. Um, and we also normally, if you are awarded a grant, you can't apply for another grant for two years. We said, this is a one year thing. We're gonna do it this year and you can reapply next year for whatever programs you wanted to uh, apply for in the first place. So that's another significant change. Um, what stands out to our members, because we are member based and, and some of the voters will have been on the committee and they will have deep knowledge of your program and everything that you submitted in your packet and others will not. So, so it varies on, you know, to get from one phase to the next. Initially in your application, you need to be like Michelle was saying from Applied Materials, you need to be concise and clear on what are your objectives and what are your results going to be and how are you going to measure impact um, and, and, and making sure your financials are uh, clear and that everybody can understand them. When you get to that final stage, the semi-finalist and the fate and this finalist, and you're in front of the members, it's really about pulling on their heartstrings. What are the stories that you can tell them in you know, eight minutes that are gonna make them think, wow, this is where we should give our money. So, you know, then you need to have a compelling storyline that uh, that will really pull at the heartstrings of the membership. So um, I think. I think I answered most of your questions. If we, if I miss something, you can let me know, Nancy. Okay, I think you. Oh, yes, I agree. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more questions later. But is there anything that mistakes that are commonly made that you see? Anything to avoid? When um. Well, I mean, I think sometimes people. Um, you know, in the applications, they, they give us these really long applications. And like Michelle was saying, you need to make your, your uh, program clear. You need, to, you need to let us know who it is targeted at, what the impacts are going to be, what are the results you're going to measure. Um, and so making everything clear and concise is, is important. Um, 
The other mistakes that sometimes people make is that, you know, we have a certain percentage that's allocated for operations and we have certain other um, budgets that, and you have to show how you're going to use the full budget within two years. So sometimes that's not clear to us. Mm -hmm. And then that could be something that can knock you out because we don't understand your budget. Um, so paying attention to the financials and making sure that we, we have a good view of that is important as well. Good to know. Thank you so much, Michelle. All right. Um, well, last on the list here. Let's see. Okay, Mike, we're going to go over here for two seconds. Michael McCoy, Senior Program Officer for the Meadows Foundation. You are on. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for everyone that's uh, tuned in to Zoom. Um, I, I, I will talk about COVID-19 and its impact on our funding, but it's really going to be slight. So let me just start off with just like uh, COVID never existed and just generally, how do you get money from the Meadows Foundation? We, we are very broad based. We are very flexible. So when I get to the point of uh, what tragic mistakes that you can make, there are very few because we are so flexible. We're not checklist people. It's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't include three financial statements, and so you are not, uh, you're not going to be considered. Uh, we, we don't do grading, that you got to have a 75 or more on our uh, rating scale before you uh, could be considered. Uh, we have four program officers uh, working for the in, through the entire state. We're very flexible. We work with you. Uh, if you look at our webpage, we, it may seem confusing because we don't have uh, online application. We really don't like them. We don't like applications where you have boxes to fill in. Uh, we're, we're storytellers. When we present to our board, and, and if you do make it to that point, we uh, program officers do present. We become uh, less of a skeptic when you first come in, and certainly as an advocate for you when we present to the board. When, when we uh, uh, get to that level, we are uh, really telling a story, your story, who you are, what you do, why you can't presently do what you want to do because you're limited in your resources. You have to uh, hire more, buy more, build more, uh, get equipment. There are barriers, asset barriers that keep you from doing more. And that's what we're interested in. We're capacity builders. So we're, uh, we, we don't like to limit ourselves. And in fact, we are active in all 254 counties. We, you do have to be a 501c3 tax exempt status organization, but the type of 501c3, we don't care. We'll work with units of governments, uh, churches, anybody. If you, got, if you got a tax letter, come on down. Uh, we're in five giving areas, and I got to go through all those. Arts, human services, health, education, civic, and culture. So essentially, whatever is your business is our business. Now, in, in those areas, in those five areas, the program officers are generalists. We were uh, recruited because we have crazy, wild backgrounds. We've had our, our fingers in every kind of pie. And uh, in fact, many of us had trouble finding jobs because people would say, wow, you, you haven't seemed like you've selected a, a field yet. And, and that's what, because the family didn't really want to be beholden to uh, experts in certain fields. They just, we are brokers. We present your interests to our board, we advocate for you, but the board has final authority and they don't want to be holding to anyone uh, in, in their decision making. So in those uh, five areas, we look for you as the experts. We're not uh, looking for you to do particular things. You just tell us in your field, in your place, in your organization, here are your problems and we will vet those, we will do a smell test, and if we feel comfortable that this is something that the board would want to consider, we will present that. Now, we also have three initiatives, uh, public education, the environment, and mental health. In those three areas, program officers are specialists. We are well-schooled in those three fields. There's a program officer for each one of those three initiatives. On our webpage, there is a approximately a 60 to 70 page strategic funding plan for each one of those initiatives. If you're uh, laboring in those uh, fields, you really need to fit your program with those strategic uh, funding plans. 
while we could do, uh, I, I handle the environmental space. So while there's tons of things that you could do in the environment, if it's not specifically in those strategic funding plans, uh, it's probably not going to be uh, funded. And then uh, let, let's talk about how to get uh, money from us. Again, we're broad based. We meet five times a year. Very flexible. I'm going to now get out your pens and paper and write this down. This is probably the only important thing I'm really going to say the whole time, the whole 15 minutes. My direct telephone number is 214-860-8131. That is the best way to get something started. Pitch me. Mm -hmm. Call me up. We In 15 minutes, I can give you a good idea of what is uh, what is good, what is possible, and if it's not possible, how to improve it before you send it in. While we are going to distribute $15 million this year, uh, we receive more since we are statewide, we do anything for everybody, and we're open like 7-Eleven. It's always come in, no deadlines. It is, um, we, we receive more than what we can say grace over. So it's probably about a 20% success rate. So I want to get you with a, a quick pitch meeting, as competitive a proposal as you could possibly have once you get into the uh, sausage factory, because it is deadly once you get in. About 80% really don't uh, survive the process. So call me before you, before you come. And uh, now, as I said, no deadlines. Let me go through the other list, no deadlines. Five times a year, they are January, April, July, September, November. So we've already had two meetings. In those two meetings, we distributed to five million. We have 10 million left. Now I'll get into the COVID side of it. At that meeting, uh, the, board, the board sets its distribution budget in November of the preceding year. So last November, they said 15 million for 2020. That was actually down a million from 2019. So they were not in a happy or comfortable mood when we started January. So at that April meeting, I was fully expecting that, that we could uh, cut that budget further. They held firm, I'm proud to say. Uh, that, that could change it any day, but they, they held firm and we will still distribute the full 15 million, so we have 10 million left. My board also had, well, the president with the board's authority has uh, set up a line of credit with uh, several of our major bankers. We have a healthy line of credit. We're not worried, as some foundations are, of eating into uh, seed corn. We can make all of our administrative, building, utilities, all of our payments, plus the 15 million that we anticipate uh, distributing this year without really impacting our corpus. So it's, it's, not doing, it, it's not doing well, but it's not going to enter into considerations as we continue through the rest of the year. What they did decide to do, that 10 million that we have left, they are going to, and again, understand we're flexible and my board does not like to be painted into corners. The 10 million, they're going to earmark more or less half of it, 5 million for COVID-19 direct response. Now, some of the other things that we will do that's COVID uh, related is, it's already been stated, if you have, you know, we really don't, we're not sticklers on time period, so everybody that has a grant right now uh, or have had grants with Meadows in the past, you know we don't beat you over the head about uh, deadlines on reports, but especially so now. We understand that uh, uh, this is, these are difficult times, and especially for you guys who are actually doing all the work out in the field. And if you, if you don't have time to get around to a Meadows report, please call me, we, we can push those reports. We will also look at on a case-by-case -case basis. If you have a grant, as already has been stated, and we are directly program people, we do not favor general operations. And so there's probably not anyone on the line that has ever received a general operating grant from the Meadows Foundation. But if you have program, call me and we can talk. You can either push the program, not right now, and we can push your deliverables, to a more appropriate time, or we will also, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, consider converting uh, all or part of program grants from us to general operations. So those are the major uh, COVID-related uh, impacts on our uh, 
funding. So in, in conclusion, uh, we are late funders. $15 million is not enough money for all 254 counties, five giving areas, three initiatives. So obviously we're niche players. And our two niches are, we are capacity builders. That's why we don't do general operations. That could change. Again, my board doesn't like to be painted into corners. But uh, presently, we're not general operating. We're looking for capacity building. Bigger, better, faster. These are things that we do right now, but in the future, we want to do more. Or we want to do those things plus a couple of other things. So that, that is your program-related budget to us is what do you need in order to do more? And then, as I said, we're late funders. So that's really the major and perhaps maybe the only fatal error that you can commit with uh, seeking funding from us, and that is coming to us too early add up and do a budget program related that will get cover all the total costs of all the things that you need to do, buy, hire, whatever, to move to the more. That's your total program budget. Have half of it pledged before you come to us. And I think I will hold there unless my moderator has <laughs> something that she wants to tell me I missed. And if not, I think it's time to open up for a general Q&A. Am I right, Nancy? Let me ask you one question first before we do that. And that is, what stands out for you in that narrative? Because I can remember back in the days. Um, do you mind if I tell people, share people what you told me a long time ago? I, I have I have never been afraid of having someone repeat something I've said. I've, I've denied it. And I have corrected it, but I have no fear of you repeating what I've said in the past. Okay, so your application is not online. We can write a narrative. And so you told me that, I'm paraphrasing, that you need to make Bruce laugh or cry on the first page. In other words. Yes, yes. Well, that is a good, that is a good marketing. All of uh, fundraising, you're not raising funds, you're doing marketing. And if you're going to be involved into the private, well, even just foundations, period, whether the private or community type foundations, family foundations, all the different ways that you can slice and dice the private uh, philanthropy uh, area, you need to do good market research because it's not a monolithic industry. What's good for you to apply to Meadows, I'm going to promise you is the wrong thing to do for uh, applying to the Maybe Foundation in Oklahoma two entirely different approaches, mm -hmm. two entirely different processes. So if you, th if you know one foundation, you know one foundation, that's, that's it. So you gotta do your market research. People in the past uh, cry about that and then say, well, you, you foundation people are so freaky and ivory tower and, and aloof and uh, I don't know how to get a hold of me. Well, it's not the case for Meadows Foundation. For, I, I gave you my phone number, call me. But yes, there are some foundations that really do not want to have a, a, a forward-looking face to the public. But uh, what, there are 70 of you on this uh, um, chat and on this Zoom meeting, at least one or two of you have had uh, a Meadows Foundation grant, probably more. Uh, if we were not forward-facing and eager to meet the public, then call each other and say, hey, did you ever get an XYZ grant from you know, that foundation? And How'd you do it? What, what's the best path? You've got to do your market research. You've got to do it for each and every foundation that you want to approach. The good side of this is that the philanthropic dollar makes up about 10% of your total, including earned income, government income, private donations, investments, endowments. Foundations are about 10%. So while you may have to do more work, there's, let's see, it, it, it won't be overall in your total fundraising scheme is not a whole lot of work, but it's vital. Does that answer it, Nancy? Yes, thank you so much. Oh, and that's specifically what were your question about making Bruce cry. Bruce is the senior vice president and runs the grant uh, department, for, of which the four of us program officers work for. Everything goes into him and he mm, sort of reads, brews, skims, uh, everything. And he's making that triage, very broad, brush approach is, does this application have any chance whatsoever of going to the directors or does it not? Mm -hmm. And if he feels that it does not, then that's a very bad position that almost guarantees you to be in the 80% that fail. 
if he can see anything in it. And that's, that's the cute way of saying it. If you can make him cry. If it's on the first page, don't bury it on page 60. That cover letter is the most important document when you send it to us. Dear Bruce, here's what we got. Here's what we need. Here's how we can get it. And here's what we will give you if you invest in us all in the first page. So he, he can very quickly say, well, it looks like there's something here. I'm gonna give it to a program officer to vet and see if we can get it in shape for a board meeting. So that's, that's what Nancy was referring to. Tell your story succinctly, quickly, powerfully in one or two pages in the cover letter so that Bruce can say, yeah. Uh, because that's what Bruce lives on. When he goes to the board of directors and the four of us are standing up there and pitching when my, when my board stands up and starts cheering or starts crying and say, oh, God, we got to give them money. That's, that's why I say it's, it's the power of the story. That's what we as brokers do. We present powerful story of powerful people doing powerful things. But just at the moment, they're a little bit limited. So let's give them help. OK. Thank you very, very much. All right, we are going to open it to questions. Now, before you all start typing your questions. Too late. <laughs> Nancy, start. They, they know the format, and they're already in there. So you might want to look in the chat bar and start pulling them up. All right. So this is a question for Meadows from Sherry Goodman. Can you share more about what the remaining 10 million in COVID response grants looks like? Are these still, okay, guys, can you not? Sarah's gonna give some directions about, don't type for a second, okay? Um, are these still within your focus areas? Are, are they for basic needs like many COVID response opportunities? Are these still program grants are they, or are they operating? So that's what I was going to say for directions, folks, is I, in order to um, tell the panelists what your questions are, we'll need to stop typing while <clears throat> we give the questions to the panelists. Okay, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, again, no corners, don't like to be painted in corners. In the COVID, the five million is COVID related. Uh, in several, uh, several times in the past, I'm thinking of the 2002 uh, recession, uh, the savings loan, the tech bubble, 2008-9 uh, with the great financial crisis, uh, we abandoned, well not abandoned, we added uh, general operations to our uh, suite of, of, of programs or what we would uh, grant. Moved away uh, slightly from program uh, related grants. That was the strongest thing, even during those financial crises. If you came to us and said, hey, we handle the crisis. We don't have a problem financially, but we do want to do more during these troubling times. We have this great program. Would you fund it? That was the best position. But we also had open emergency uh, direct grants for general operations that went to a, a, a certainly a competitive area, which is to say, we're not doing well. And in fact, we're shutting the doors next month. Can't make payroll. Uh, for all these reasons, uh, we do good, but sorry, we're winking out in 60 days. Can you help us? We did open the doors to funding doors to that type of uh, situation, and we will do so again with that 5 million. Of course, with the COVID response, we're looking primarily for right now for people who will address the situation directly. We're interested mostly in food security. And secondly, uh, childcare for frontline workers. And, uh, and, but the door is also open for, uh, hey, we're going out of business, but you know, dang, why we'll do that, that sure is a, a weak position to, to be in. We are considering setting up a nonprofit loan fund, which we did in 2002 and again in 2008. We're working with our colleagues in Dallas to, 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 to do that. And maybe that will be, uh, a relief valve for us that we could say, if we do establish it, say, okay, not us, but here, we're gonna send it to the nonprofit uh, loan fund, which had uh, weak underwriting standards so mm -hmm. that people who were going to wink out could possibly get. We did that in 2002, we did it by ourselves, a million dollars. I think we, we gave loans for those who just couldn't make it. And I think we, about a third of the money we did uh, end up uh, forgiving. On the other five million, we are obviously not enough money to do our business as usual. So we're looking at our initiatives first 
And then secondly, we don't do uh, multi-year funding, but we will hang with folks for three years. We just put you through the ringer three times, three decisions, three grant applications. Uh, some of you, uh, I see Heather's on the line. Uh, some of you are already within that three-year cycle and you're looking for your second and your third. That's our second priority and then everybody else. Cool. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this question is from Kathleen and it's for every panelist and I have to scroll back up now. Just a second. Um, thank you for being here, she says. Has there been an internal conversation about specifically supporting senior citizens as they are especially vulnerable during the pandemic? Let's... Um, Let's see, how about uh, Michelle from Applied Materials? Can you take that question? Sure. Um, with our immediate rapid response grants, um, I think we, we understand there's definite vulnerable populations. Seniors are one of them, as well as the homeless population. Um, we were doing a lot around food delivery um, services. So we did grants kind of around the country to food banks. We also worked with like Meals on Wheels programs. Um, in addition to doing grants, we were also getting PPE in, in some cases too. So for example, we had um, a whole group of employees sew mask for our local Meals on Wheels um, programs. Um, and then also providing face shields um, when appropriate for folks. So Meals on Wheels was one of them that we looked at. Um, they seniors and needs for seniors and basic needs for seniors would fall underneath our civic engagement or basic needs category. So I think it's a definite area for us to consider as we move forward in grant making, um, knowing that they are a vulnerable population um, and that in, in, in support of basic needs, we're going to be supplying and supporting that population. We also sent over um, hand sanitizing wipes out to both Caritas locally in Austin but also some homeless shelters and some senior citizen centers um, and, or some organizations working with seniors. So we do understand they're a particularly vulnerable population. And so we are trying to provide support. I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. How do we reach your employees for matching gifts? Can we do a presentation? And that's Cynthia from Project Transitions. So currently, um, we are only on essential employees at the office. Um, we have a platform that we use that's um, housed by your cause, and um, you can post volunteer opportunities and engagement opportunities at the your cause platform. I know a number of tech companies in town use them as a platform. So um, our employees can view opportunities there to engage. Um, and if they, I think most importantly, if you have volunteers that work with you, I think it's to talk to them about um, understanding that there are matching programs. So in addition to the employee matching gifts program, we have a volunteer time match grant program as well. So if employees volunteer 10 hours of their time per quarter, they get a $100 grant to donate to a charity of their choice. So that's an additional $400 that they can donate just for volunteering. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as you can communicate uh, matching gift opportunities to your volunteers to say, please make sure you check with your company. Many companies have matching gifts in the area. Um, and then I'm happy to take it from there and walk them through the process on how to um, take advantage of those funds. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, Sherry, I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna get, pick up Darla's question um, for awesome. That's you, Megan. How do you measure and share your impact? How do other awesome chapters measure their impact? Well, so first of all, I want to say I think that I may have missed in my presentation, but our grants are, we give out $1,000 micro grants. And so our, our aim is for smaller projects uh, where $1,000 makes a big difference. Um, and part of the no strings attached idea is that we don't have once we give out the grant it's given that's it we hope that people like if, when we fund plays we hope that we get tickets to go see the play we love to share our, our grantees on social media but as far as measuring and reporting there's no reporting um, we don't report to anybody and nobody reports to us uh, and how do other chapters measure I'm not sure um, every chapter operates differently, uh, surprisingly differently. 
Um, and also, if you want to apply for a grant, you should look us up on awesomeaustin.org or um, Awesome ATX on social media, just so everybody has that information. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, let me get back to Sherry's. On these questions for all, um, Sherry has two questions for all. Um, okay, here we go. What is your advice to nonprofits that are not serving basic needs but still have urgent needs due to loss of prospective funding, reduced fundraising, et cetera? And how do you recommend approaching grantors without sending tone deaf in the midst of the current crisis? That's an interesting question. Um, who would like to take that? Mike? <laughs> 214-860-8131. You know, okay. call me and let's talk about it. That, again, that's, that's one of the weakest. It, it, it is part of our business, line of business now, but it's, it's a weak position to call in and say, I'm going out of business, can you help? Uh, maybe that's not, you know, if I walk into the board and say, I've got 15 of these, they're all going out of business, that's, that, well, that's, mm -hmm. that's just not good optics. Uh, we are involved in that, but you know you have a fiduciary responsibility to keep that organization alive. So you got to do whatever you can with whomever you can to get it done. So that's why I say, give me a call and let's see. But I'm not as hopeful as I would if you called and say, uh, "Damn it, we're we're full steam ahead and we are going to do more. We want to really serve the our, our folks. They're hurting out there in a very special way." but we need some more to do more. That's, that's the way to go. Okay. Um, and another question for all. What would you recommend grantees with pending applications do? Is it appropriate for them to reach out to their prospective funders to communicate their change in needs, or do you recommend waiting based on the volume of requests you receive? I'll or have to jump into that. If you've got a pending one with uh, Meadows, a call. And let, yeah, uh, we have been calling Pending can be two different uh, meanings. One, it, uh, Bruce, it's on Bruce's office, in his office. He hasn't looked at it yet. Uh, he hasn't assigned it to anyone. So that's probably a really soft and uh, vague area that where you could potentially be lost. The program officers, the four officers, are calling their folks and saying, uh, is this still it? Is this the time to build a $20 million building? Um, or do you want to pull this out and back? and wait for another time, or do you want to switch it to something else? Right. Awesome Foundation, just fill out another application. Okay. Oh. I'd, like to, I'd like to jump in also here. I think here the key is communication. So if you have a grant application that, that you have applied for funding for and you know there's changes because your needs have changed, you're not able to do a school program, for example, because schools are closed, you're having to shift to an online process, you should be communicating that with us, right? I mean, it might just be an email like, I just want to let you know we, we submitted this application, here are the changes. And as proactive as you can be to reach out, I think the better. Um, we want to be able to be flexible, but if I don't know how it's changing, I can make, it would be awful if I made an assumption that just said this isn't happening, so they don't need funding when you do need funding. So, and I, I, I don't usually make assumptions, I'm just telling you in general for, um, for when you apply. So, I would reach out if you know that there's changes to pending applications and let them know what those changes are to let um, folks know so that they can take those into consideration as they're making grant funding decisions. Um, I think all everybody in the funding community realizes this, this is uncertain times. We're, we're having to be flexible. We're having to kind of think through. Um, I wanna know that you are thinking, that you are making the necessary changes to be reactive um, to what, what's happening, and, but, but proactive in a sense of reaching out. Uh, quick question: How do they reach out? Do they reach out to you personally, or is your they, is there uh, an email on your website? How did, how did that? There's an email on our website um, that you can reach out to us. Um, it's applied underscore um, materials underscore foundation at amat.com. Um, and if you happen to have, I think my email is also listed on on some of the sites, so you're you're fine with reaching out to me as well. Um, 
because you know we're we were right in the middle of our grant process where we were about to do notifications um, when we all of a sudden had a lockdown in the Bay Area. So we're actually having to shift systems to do electronic transfers rather than checks. And there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, so we're having to move forward based on what we know, right? So all we know is what you've applied for, and that's what we're making decisions based on, assuming that they are happening. So it's great if you can, um, if you know there's a pending decision, let us know what those changes might be, or if there's no changes, it's great to say, you know, we, we submitted this application two months ago, just letting you know we're still on track to make this happen. Good advice. Let me ask the other Michelle that same question that Sherry asked about, uh, what would you recommend grantees with pending applications to do? Is it appropriate for them to reach out to your, to your uh, foundation? If there's been changes, for instance. Yes, uh, and, and that is one of the things, I mean, because of where we are in our cycle, I mean, we've been trying to communicate pretty, uh, pretty regularly with the applicants themselves. So those that are still in the process know they're still in the process and we, we've been, um, and those that we, we've now declined um, should have received that information as well. And, and so we have asked all of our applicants that are you know, still our finalists to say, to let us know what's different now. We anticipate that in a lot of these programs um, that there will be changes and just communicate with us what those are so that our membership when they are voting can understand what it is they're voting on for your programs if for some reason somebody was an applicant and didn't receive um, uh, any communication um, then certainly there's uh, the emails that um, they've received prior communications from that they can um, reach out to and just touch base with okay I remember when we applied, um, we had a little group of ladies, five of them, and we had, that's who our contact was with all the time. So is that the same? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, let me get to Hope's question, and then I'm gonna come back to another one. Hope asks, besides Awesome, this is for everybody, besides Awesome, do either of your organizations, I don't know if either, but I guess it would be the rest, Provide funding for organizations in Virginia. No, I know you don't. No. Impact Austin does not. Impact Austin, you have to, I mean, if you're in Virginia, but you're serving, largely serving a Central Texas based uh, need, and then, then you could apply, but we're expecting that your services and your programs are addressing local populations, so. Okay, what about Michelle from Applied Materials? We actually have a small location in Manassas, Virginia, and so we have done very small grants there in the past. So they are one of our locations, but it's a tiny location, so the grants are much smaller. Um, I would say typically they run around $2,000 to $2,500, but it's usually around that Manassas, Virginia area. So is it safe to assume that you have to have an applied materials in your state? But if you do have it in your state, then there's some way to apply. And, and if you go to our online application, it walks you through a quick quiz to say if it's the right fit. Like we ask, are you a 501c3? Are you in one of our locations? And we have a listing of our locations. So you have to almost go through these questions to show that you are the right fit to do the application. Um, so Central Texas, definitely. The Bay Area, definitely. Um, we do have a very small site in Manassas, Virginia, um, Gloucester, Massachusetts, and then Kalispell, Montana, and Portland, Oregon. Those are kind of our bigger areas. Um, but during that quiz process, right before you get to your application, it'll kind of help formulate exactly if you're the right fit. Good to know. All right. Um, I'm going to go back up to Darla. How important this is for everybody? How important to you is it to know that your prospective grantees have a history of being impactful? If it is important, how do you prefer to access historical impact information for an organization? How do you prefer to access historical impact? Hmm, that's an interesting question. With the first part, yeah, the history of impact. 
This um, is Michelle. So one of the things we do in our process um, is our grant review committees um, break out into subgroups and, and each group is assigned a, a, a set of applications and they do their own research um, and, and see what they can find about the organization. So they'll start searching the web and searching different things that they use to find out information. And it is one of our criteria that an organization be credible and that they have a, a proven track history. And, and so, so we will look for that. So if you can include information on that um, within your application, that's, that's useful for us to, to have. And we do ask some uh, questions along those lines in the applications itself. Okay. Hey, Mike, I want to ask that question of you because when I was up at the palace, I told you a story that was a real compelling story because I remembered what you told me about Bruce, make him laugh or cry on the first page, right? So I told you this compelling story of this gal um, that was uh, an artistic gal in the education department at the Palace Theater. And you listen very carefully as you always do. And you said, that is a wonderful story, but you have to be able to show how that impact affects the broader community. So then you are mixing data and story. Is that, am I saying that right? Well, no, not mixing. The, the story gets everybody's interest, but the, no one pulls out a checkbook unless you got deliverables. <laughs> but it, back in the day, yes, we did. You made a director cry, you got a check. Mm -hmm. And or you had a, a, a picture of a bunch of babies or uh, some birds or anything that was pleasant. And you said, hey, we're helping this group, this population, you got to check. And then we turned to, well, OK, let's have deliverables. And uh, what we did were essentially production numbers. We're going to serve 21. We're going to serve 400. We're going to serve 15 percent more. All production. And, and that's how you got grants. You had a pretty picture, a nice population, you're going to do good things, and you were going to quantify how much more you want to do. Now the evolution is, my board says, okay, those two are great, but so what? You're going to do these nice things to these people who are on hard times, and you're going to do more, but what does 15% mean? Mm -hmm. you, 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 gotta have, you gotta ask the so what question, you have to answer the so what question. We will do all these things for all these people and we will give you this production. And here is the impact. The, there will be peace in the Middle East by next Thursday. Okay, there's, there's, there's an impact that we can sell. Now your question is how do we vet that? We really don't. We look for you to do that. The only thing I will say is, I'm sorry, you don't really don't have deliverables here that I can work with. You've got to give me something. But you have to come up with them. I do the smell test. I'll do, I'll do the math. I'll do the work. And if I feel that, well, yes, this is something that I can sell, then we go to the board and we find out how, how right I am. But so then the board will ask questions. And they may say something like, great work, but $100,000 for that? No, let's take a pass on it. Okay. All right. For, um, for, awesome, for the Austin awesome Foundation, that's actually particularly important that you demonstrate some sort of history. And it usually comes in the form of either like your website or what you've posted online, that you've been hosting an open mic night for the last, every month for the last X number of months because we don't ask for any financials. So your financial stability isn't as important as the fact that you actually have been doing something awesome and will continue to do something awesome and just need $1,000 to make it more awesome. So that's kind of important for us. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay, and that makes sense when you don't look for the financials. Okay, another question from Meadows from Cynthia of Project Transitions. If we have at least 50% funding for a building project, is it best to apply right away or wait until the very end of our capital campaign? That's a, that's a great question because it, it demonstrates uh, scope. We are late funders in in order to be very flexible, we, we operationalize that by saying have half of what you need before you come to us. If you're a mom and pop and, you're, and your total cost to do something really great is um, $200,000, that's total cost, and you have raised half, 100, 
you come to us, 100 is kind of in our, uh, that's a good price point for us. Our average grant size probably is somewhere between 75 and 150. Uh, we do less, we do more, but that's, that's a good price point. So you could say, hey, 200,000 total, we've raised 100. Hey, Meadows, would you do the other 100? There's a good chance that if we really, really loved it, the deliverables were great, we felt great, we had a prior relationship with you, the board remembered you and all the wonderful things you've done in the past that 75 to 100,000 could come, yes. Now, some of you are very large dogs and you're doing big, big, big thing and $200,000 is, wa is walking around money. And you're, you're putting up a $20 million building that's gonna have 130 uh, permanent supportive housing units to uh, address your homeless population in your city. That is a big, big project. And coming to us and say, hey, it's 20 million to do it. It's great, you worked with us before, you know we can do it. We have uh, 10 million, we're only 10 million short. Can we put that in? Well, yes, technically, because I have to range like this, that technically, yes, you have half. But again, we're late funders, so being 10 million short, it's gonna sit on my desk for a while. And it really, if it's gonna sit on somebody's desk, it's better sit on you. You said in that answer, and I think this is important for project transitions, because I know they haven't gone to you before, I don't think they have, and they house the HIV, um, and excuse me, Cynthia, if I'm not stating this correct, but let's say they did have 10 million, 8 million raised, but you've never had a relationship with them before. Are they still- Re Relationship is not, I saw that in the uh, yeah. deal that somebody said, how often do you get uh, cold proposals that get funded with no interaction or relationship with the program officer? Uh, it, well, again, it's already been stated here, communicate, communicate, communicate. So if you're sitting as a, a, a market person, a fundraiser development person for your uh, institution and you're of the mind that, hey, I don't have to pick up the phone. All I got to do is write um, a, a letter or an email and then let it go through the process and maybe I'll get money, maybe I won't. I, I, I'm worried about your uh, eff, uh, efficacy in, in, in the industry you have a fiduciary responsibility. So that means you are a salesperson. Go out and sell, sell, do cold calls, do follow up. Uh, follow the principle that the first thing you do every morning when you go to work is something that will guarantee that you will get money. The second thing you do is something that will lead you to number one. And the third thing you do is everything else. So it, having relationship is vitally important. Okay. Thank you. Now. We have exactly one minute left before I do the wrap up and explain to people how they get more questions answered. But uh, let's do that last question about, does each program officer focus on a particular priority area? Uh, that's for you, Mike. I'm sorry, would you repeat it? Um, does each program officer focus on a particular- No, 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 uh, sort of, kind of, yeah. So I was going to use a term that we are uh, uh, specialists, uh, special generalists. We are, we are hired, as I said, because our board does not want to, they don't want to, they don't want me to have a PhD in um, middle ages art. And so I say, well, you know, if you're smart, like I am, you, you're going to do this. They, they don't want to be in that position. They want brokers. They want someone who knows something about everything in Texas. And we have networks that we can go, yes, I don't know what's going on in happy Texas every day, all the time, but I have a contact in happy. And if you're from Happy, I'm going to be talking to them and saying, how are they? Who are they? What do they do? And so uh, uh, in, in, in for the five giving areas that broadly we are, we are all generalists. But three of us do handle the specialized initiatives of public education, mental health, and the environment. And I am the environmental program officer, but I also do affordable housing, South Texas, ambulances, ballet, uh, emergency grants, uh, anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. It is great to hear from all of you, and I'm going to do a wrap-up. Uh, we have to leave at 1.45 because our Zoom host has another Zoom session to host at uh, 2. So I'm going to switch over here. I'm going to see if this works. Um, and I don't think it did. Let me see. Just a second. Oh, wait a second. I have to share my screen. Two seconds here. Share. And then I have to go from current slide. There we go. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, okay. 
Now, um, we do need to wrap up and understand you still have questions. So if anybody has questions, I want you to send your questions to me at nancy at poweredemission.com. And our wonderful, generous panelists have agreed that I can then um, sort out the question by panelists and send questions to them. So if you can get me your questions by Friday, I will try to get your questions to the panelists by early next week. If you're already a member of Austin Nonprofit Meetup um, and have not joined our Facebook page, please do that. And there's a closed Facebook page, and there is the little cover page looking uh, icons there. Now, if you're out of state and you need to and you'd like to join us in Nonprofit Meetup, I just found out that you can do that, but you'll have to email me so I can explain how to do it. Otherwise, if you haven't joined, just go to Austin Nonprofit Meetup and join for free there. I'd also very much like your feedback about this meetup and your ideas for future topics, but want to make that super easy for you. And that's not going to be a survey. I'm going to send you an email uh, later today with just a few questions that you can answer right within the email and then hit reply. And that will help guide Austin Nonprofit meeting, uh, Meetup going forward. For those of you who have been coming to every single meetup since November of 2018, I'm so glad you're still here. All of you that are new, please share this meetup because we have wonderful resources to share with you every single month. And I want to take this opportunity to thank our Zoom host, Ms. Shannon Mandrum, and of course our funders, our wonderful funders, for taking their time sharing their experience and wisdom, and most of all, for the support they have provided to our community. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>